All right, in the last video, we just learned about derivatives. So now we're going to talk a little bit about notation and higher derivatives. So if we're given y is equal to f of x, how can we show the derivative? Well, I showed you one example, which is f prime of x. We put a little apostrophe right after our function to denote a derivative. But what we can also do if we're given y is equal to f of x, we can do y prime. Or there's another notation that's going to be commonly used, which is dy over dx. This means the derivative of y with respect to x. Or if we don't want to write with our y, we want to write with our function. We can say the derivative of f of x with respect to x. So d over dx of f of x. And some notation I'm going to introduce to you just if you look at old calculus books, sometimes is a capital D with f of x, and then there's a capital D with a small x of f of x. And these ones aren't really ever used. They're kind of rare. They're used in old texts when they had typewriters and they wanted to make it easy. So that's a notation that you probably won't see in your introductory calculus videos or ever before. So we're going to do a little theorem here because there's one important thing about derivatives that we haven't discussed yet. And here is the lovely theorem. We want to show that if our function f is differentiable at a point a, then it's also continuous at a. So if f is differential, then it is continuous at that same point. So what do we know? I'm, I'm going to do some crazy tricks. I'm going to try to explain what I'm doing here to prove to you that this is true. Uh, if your prof is challenging, he might ask you to prove this on an exam, but it's unlikely, but it's good just for the details. Okay, so we assume that f is differentiable. And what does it mean to be differentiable? That means that f prime at a point a is equal to the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. So this is our definition of the derivative from a previous video. So we know this is true. We know this is absolutely 100% true. And what does it mean to be continuous? Well, we have to prove that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to f of a. This is our definition of continuity. So we're going to rewrite this a little bit, and I'm going to show you what we're trying to prove. So we're going to rewrite this. Uh, I should put one little thing in here. f of a, this is the same thing as writing the limit as x approaches a of f of a. They both come out to the same thing, so we can write that in, and this is going to help us with one of our laws mainly our limit laws of addition or subtraction. So we want to prove that the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a is equal to zero. And you can see this by moving this over to the left side, and then you have a zero on the right, and limit as x approaches a of f of x minus the limit as x approaches a of f of a equal to zero. But we're using our limit laws to move things around. And we just basically want to show that the difference is nothing at that point, which means it's continuous. So this might be a little bit difficult, but hopefully you'll follow along here. So we're going to take, well, we're going to start with f of x minus f of a. So this is what we're going to start with. We're, we're going to take the difference and we're going to try to show it's zero. So we're going to start off with multiplying the top and bottom by x minus a because we want to get uh, the definition of the derivative involved because we know that f prime of a is equal to this definition here, sort of, sort of. So these two statements are equal. In fact, I'm going to rewrite the statement on the right side. So that way 
we can keep things clean and I can show you that I'm doing operations to both sides at the same time. Okay, so we're at this point now and we are going to take the limit of both sides at this point. So we're going to take the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a and this is going to be equivalent to the limit as x goes to a of everything on this side. So I'm going to break this up right away just to show you guys and this is multiplied by the limit as x goes to a of x minus a and again these are just our limit laws we're working with here so what do we know at this point we know that this part right here is equivalent to f prime of a using our definition of a derivative and the limit as x goes to a of this portion here is equal to a minus a, which I will just rewrite right now. We know that is zero. So f prime of a times zero is equal to zero. So the limit as x goes to a of this thing right here is equal to zero. Therefore, we have proved our theorem. So again, I'll walk you through this one more time using the definition of the derivative here and the definition of continuity. We want to take a point where we can show that if something is differentiable, which we have used right here, then it is continuous and we're showing that this is equal to zero. So hopefully that made sense to you. If not, you can watch it a couple more times. Try to wrap your head around it. It's not crucial. It's just an important theory for a true or false question. Am I going through the proof? It's much easier to remember things if you've done the full proof. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at our last topic for today, which are higher derivatives. And I'm not going to do any limits here for the derivatives, but I'm going to show you some examples and just how we write things out, basically. So we're going to go through these examples really quick. So I'm going to give you a function f of x, and it's going to equal to x cubed minus x. Now we know how to write our first derivative, f prime of x, which uh, if I do the derivative quickly, it'll be 3x squared minus 1. Don't worry about how I got there now, this is just to illustrate the example of notation. So what do we do right now? Uh, well, we don't have to write this as f prime of x. Perhaps we want to write it as dy dx. And we'll write this first one as y. Actually, you know what? Let's, let's write both of these so I can show two notations at once. So now this second point, we're going to do the second derivative, which is just taking the derivative of the first derivative. So we're going to take a derivative with respect to x of our previous derivative dy dx. And how do we do this notation? Well, this is written as d squared y over dx squared. Note, and I really shouldn't write this but I'll write it all the way in the top over here. This is not the same as dy over dx squared. That is not the same as that. Absolutely not the same. Don't ever do that. Those are two completely different things. This is the first derivative squared up here. You take the first derivative and you square it. This notation here is the second derivative. All right, and if I do this really quickly, then the second derivative will just be 6x. So a quick example of notation here, you just keep adding prime. So third derivative, f triple prime of x. Apparently this will not be erased. There we go. Also can be written as d3y over dx3, which would just be 6. All right, so I want to take an example from physics here, and I've been avoiding this for the longest time because we haven't gotten to derivatives yet, but at this point, I think it's totally okay to mention particle motion. So we have a bunch of different values. We have position function, which we're going to call S of T. Okay, now we're going to take the derivative of a position. And when we take the derivative of a position, we get velocity, vt. And this is equal to the derivative of our position function. 
And what about the next one? Well, we can get acceleration, at, by taking the derivative of the velocity function, which is the second derivative of the position function. And if we go one step further, we can get the jerk function, which we'll call j of t. And of course, if we just continue on with this lovely trend of differentiating, we can go on and on and on and get some more information. But all of these functions are linked by derivatives. And just to show you, let's say we have a position that starts at, uh, let's say, s of 0 is equal to 10, and s of 5 is equal to 60. Then, if we want to know the velocity, let's, let's say, let's take the average velocity over the interval 0, 5. So then, of course, we get 60 minus 10 all over 5 seconds, which is 10 meters per second. So you can see that this rate of change is velocity. So obviously, if the rate of change of the position functions is velocity, then the instantaneous rate of change is derivative, which again comes out to be velocity. So it's, it's fairly intuitive. We're going to have some more questions involving this when we learn how to take derivatives really, really quickly. But for now, I just thought I'd introduce you guys to this fact. So. There's no practice questions in this section. It's all theory. So I'll see you guys next time where we'll learn how to do derivatives a little faster. Actually, I think I'm going to get some limit practice in there first, but one of those two.